I'm sure at some point in your life you've had the experience of having to say something which you knew was going to cause you pain. Say, for example, you did something wrong at school and the teacher said, who spilt the orange on the ground? Who knocked the thing off the table? Who sat on Mr. Cahill for all of small break? You know, and like you could, then someone's going to have to raise their hand and say, it was me. So you're going to have to raise your hand and, and bear the consequences. Okay? So it's, it's not a nice feeling because you could, you're thinking, oh, can I get away with it? If I, can I point to someone else? Can I, can I create a diversion? Can I create a mini explosion? And oh, look, it's, it's something exploding. I don't have to answer the question. Can, is it, you know, can you get out of it? Can you avoid the punishment, the detention, whatever it is? You know, it's in, similar things happen at home. You know, who left the, who put the stinking milk back in the fridge and now everything in the fridge tastes like stinking milk, I mean. Um, <clears throat> and sorry, it was me. And then, you know, you're grounded. Okay, so, you know, then there's going to be some sort of a punishment or pain or something uh, due to it. Uh, some, some sort of a, uh, un something uncomfortable. Okay. In our gospel today, I just, I always imagine when I hear this kind of a gospel, the apostles there with Jesus, okay? So they've seen Jesus preach. Now imagine when Jesus is out there and someone who's kind of smart or describes the Pharisees who try to trick Jesus, try to corner him, you know, ask him something that, he, that they feel he can't get, a, get, a, get out of. You know, this woman was caught in adultery. Uh, our law allows us to stone her. What do you say? You know, so if we say stoner, then he's responsible for his death. And if you say don't stoner, then what? You don't care about the law? It's one of those situations where you can't win, really. Well, apparently. And then they see how Jesus gets around. You can imagine the apostles going, yeah, we're, we're with him. Or when he heals a guy, when he, you know, he heals the sick, or when there's a lame guy who's been lame since birth or whatever, and Jesus heals him and up he goes. And uh, yeah, we're, we're with him, the, the Nazarene, that's, uh, that's our boss. You know, you can imagine this. You know, you can, and uh, you know, you can just imagine it, it. It feels good. Feels good to be with Jesus. He's he's doing cool things. You know, his his reputation is growing, and people are flooding in or flooding out from the cities to to meet him uh, out in the countryside or wherever it was. You know, I'm sure it was it was great. It felt really good. But then this discourse on the Eucharist, like John chapter six, it it's 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 good. But like you can imagine. The apostles are listening to certain parts of it, going, "Yeah, yeah, I, 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 that's good." You know, um, no one can come to me unless the Father, unless he is drawn by the Father who sent me. Okay, we can go with that. Yeah, and I will raise him up on the last day. It's a fairly strong statement. I will raise him up on the last day. It's written in the prophets; they will all be taught by God, and to hear the teaching of the Father and learn from it is to come to me. Okay. But now we start to get into this kind of uncomfortable territory. I tell you most solemnly, everybody who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Okay, so he's speaking metaphorically, I presume. Your fathers ate man in the desert, they are dead. But this is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that a man may eat it and not die. You can imagine people listening going, sorry, what? What? What, what, exa what, what is he saying? Ex ex I mean, wh when, when does the metaphor stop here? What, what do you... Because he can't be saying what I think he's saying. Okay? I am the living bread which has come down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And you, again, you can imagine them going, hold on just a second. He's going to clarify it now. Oh, it's one of them parable things or something. Okay. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh for the life of the world. Now, at that point, you could just imagine the apostles going, sorry, what? <laughs> uh, how, 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 how is that going to work? How do we explain this? How do we justify this? And when people think he's crazy... How do we protect him? Jesus has just said, eat my flesh. 
I'm going to give you my flesh to eat. And it gets worse. I mean, he's, he, well, then it gets better. But like for, from, from their perspective, like the apostles' perspective, he, he's going to, we'll hear it tomorrow, he drives home this message, right? It's, it's absolutely fantastic. But there is no doubt that Jesus is not speaking metaphorically or symbolically or something. The message is driven home. And you can imagine the apostles standing there going, no, no, Jesus, not, no, no. Oh, wow. Oh, dear. Because, I mean, keep in mind, like, they didn't fully get it themselves. I mean, until the Last Supper and, and, and all, like, the Old Testament and the New Testament as such come together, or the New, Te- New Testament, the Old Testament kind of becomes the New Testament, if you will, um, all of this was still, was still quite foreign. Just the, the, idea, the idea of the Eucharist, the idea of giving yourself to someone to eat. How? How? <laughs> how, how, how is this possible? Just... I, I don't get it. I don't get it. And we'll see later on. The, the, I'll probably hear it on Saturday. Um, people start to leave. The crowds start to leave. And then Jesus looks at the apostles and says, Are you going to leave me too? And St. Peter, we love Peter. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the message of eternal life. I'm not saying I, I get what you, what you said earlier, but I mean, I'm not leaving either. But like, just when Jesus, I just, I, 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 I love Jesus, I do. Uh, I do. But it's like when he drops these kind of truth bombs, it's just, it, it, I love that Jesus doesn't care about popularity. He knew this was going to be difficult to understand. He's not, he's not trying to irk people either, but like, He's not dancing around the truth. This is what it is. This is what Jesus is setting up. I'm going to give myself to you as food. I am the lamb of God. And the lamb during the Passover meal was consumed, was eaten. So I'm going to remain with you. As we see the disciples on the road to Emmaus, which we read a few days ago, a few Sundays ago. He disappeared from their sight, but remained with them in the Eucharist. So again, it's a, it's a sign I'm I'm visibly gone, but I'm still with you. I'm still with you. So it, 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 it's a profound teaching. Not comfortable, not easy, but true. And it's, it, it, this is the, the, one of the core mysteries of our faith, and the main one being the, 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 the Trinity itself. But to try and get our heads around this, we shouldn't really try fully, as in, we, sh- we should try to understand it in as much as we're capable of understanding it, and yet don't try and fully get your head around the mystery. For the Eucharist is a mystery to be adored, not a mystery to be solved. We don't try and solve this problem. We just believe and receive. We don't have to solve the Eucharist. It's good to have terms that we can put on it just so that we, we can, you know, like transubstantiation, these terms are important so that we know it's not a, a, sim, a mere symbol, uh, or we know it's not just a, just a, a shared meal and leave it at that. You know, it, it's good that we have terms that, that uh, clarify what we believe, but that doesn't mean that we understand, fully understand the mystery. I mean, even look at simple things. When you plug in your phone and your phone charges, have you any idea how that works? Have you any idea what the voltage in, in a socket is and how it goes through cables and charges your bat- how it charges a lithium ion battery? Do you know how that works? But you don't really have to. You plug it in, charge the phone, your phone works for two days, voila. Okay, so the mystery, which isn't even that big a mystery, of how a lithium-ion battery charges, it, it works. It, it does what it's supposed to do, and I'm happy enough with that. Same, similarly, with the Eucharist. When we receive the Eucharist, it is Jesus. Do I know how? Uh, not exactly. But Jesus says, this is my body. That's enough for me. This is my body. So Jesus is sacramentally present. Can, G- can God do this? Absolutely. So can, can, he, can he change simple gifts into his own body, blood, soul, and divinity? Yes, he can. So we don't have to get your head around it. You're not going to. I mean, we, can, we can't even get our head... For all of you wonderful people out there who are married, you can't get your heads around your beautiful husband or wife. I mean, you're married 20, 30, 40 years, and they're still a mystery to you which is good, because they're people. 
there's constantly more to discover in them, which is wonderful. But God then, who's an infinitely greater being than us, how on earth are we going to get our heads? We're not, we're not, we're not. Like a fish to understand tax returns. Just, so we don't come to the Eucharist with our little booklets trying to solve what's happening here. We come to the Eucharist with an opening, with an open heart. The Lord is telling us that receiving the Eucharist is a greater miracle than the Hebrews witnessed finding manna in the desert, which fed them for years. And they had this double portion the day before the Sabbath. I mean, absolutely miraculous stuff. And he's saying this is a greater miracle of the Eucharist. And this is what we get to do as Catholics. This should never become ordinary. This should never become comfortable. And this should never be explained away as a mere common meal because then it makes everyone, then it reduces the mystery, then there's no mystery anymore, so then that's, that's easy. We just come, we share a bit of food together. That's, that's not what the Last Supper is. That's not what the Eucharist is. We have the honor and privilege of receiving Jesus into our hearts and souls. Fulton Sheen explains it this way. He says, when, <clears throat> when a mom is nursing her child, without saying the words, just by the very action of nursing her child, she says, this is my body, take and eat. This is my body, take and drink. If you do not eat or drink from me, you will not have life within you. And it's the most natural thing that happens even before we, we understand language, we understand this action. If you're a child, doing this feeds me, makes me feel whole and full and a bit belchy. It makes me feel healthy. And so in, in, in a similar kind of, when we reduce these, well, when we try to understand these miracles in the simplest way, it's nourishment for our soul. It's like God, our Father, nourishing us <clears throat> with the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus the Son. And so we ask the good Lord today to renew our Eucharistic love, to renew our Eucharistic fervor, and to bless all the work of those who promote Eucharistic adoration here in Ireland and indeed throughout the world. We pray for a new sense of awe when we attend Mass, a new reverence when we receive Holy Communion, a new desire to make him known and loved by the whole world, that all might cry out, with our psalmist, cry out with joy to God, all the earth. Amen.